This is the Chris DeGall Show podcast. Okay, guys, let's just rip. And Chris DeGall. Chris DeGall. Chris, thanks for being with me tonight. Chris uh, DeGall. I'm joined now by Chris DeGall. Now. He puts the broad in broadband. It's Chris DeGaulle. The Chris DeGaulle Podcast is presented by USMedicalPlan.com. Save big money monthly and get better health coverage at USMedicalPlan.com. Middle of the week. It's Wednesday, the 20th day of September. Thanks a lot for downloading the Chris DeGaulle Show podcast. We are busy today. I got a lot. Uh, Ray Epps, the guy that everybody's wondered about uh, on January 5th, 6th, both 5th and 6th, he was on tape. Uh, a lot of people thought he was a Fed or think he is a Fed. He's now been charged. I'll give you my reaction to that. Uh, John Fetterman standing tall with the UAW strikers uh, in another hilarious John Fetterman moment. Some uh, some thoughts on that. Ron DeSantis not happy that Kevin McCarthy has said he thinks Donald Trump's going to become the nominee. There's also some fighting uh, in the House right now between a couple of Florida Republicans, B- Byron Donalds and uh, Matt Gates which we'll unpack a little of that today as well. There's a lot, actually, and, and much more, but uh, sit tight. I think you'll enjoy today's show. Oh, and that I don't know if you heard what Pennsylvania is up to with automatic registration to vote. When you uh, go to the DMV to get your driver's license or to get it renewed, you're automatically registered to vote now. So Democrats in Pennsylvania are still up to the same old game. We'll talk with Hans von Spakovsky about that. And which state do you live in a state where he says, according to Heritage, is the most uh, secure and has the most election integrity? I'll ask him that question. That's all on the way. John Ruhlman, USmedicalplan.com. That's the website. Save yourself some big time money on health insurance costs if you buy it out of pocket by shopping with John and his team at USmedicalplan.com. He works with 80 different private health insurers, so he will find you the best possible coverage and always save you the most money possible. He tells me that on average, he's saving most people 30 to 60%, and in some cases, much more. My favorite famous story to tell you is of a personal friend who saved $2,000. He bought uh, coverage for his uh, daughter who needed some special medical attention, as well as the rest of uh, him, his spouse, another child. And uh, between those two health insurance policies to cover those four people, when he reached out, he ended up saving $2,000 because he made a phone call. And he said, Chris, it's not only 2000 cheaper a month, it's better coverage than we had. That's the kind of stuff John can do, but you've got to pick up the phone and shop it. I know a lot of people get kind of comfortable. They're like, look, I don't want to change cards or doctors. No, that's what John does. He has a customer care department. He will transition you through all of it. So, so don't fear the bureaucracy of the shopping or the transition. John will handle every bit of it. He'll also help you negotiate... If you're having health insurance troubles right now, you can't get a bill paid or there's some kind of issue, let his customer care department go to work and advocate for you too. He knows this business like the back of his hand. Saving you money, getting you better coverage is what he does for a living. USmedicalplan.com. Make sure you tell him Chris sent you and that you heard it here on the show. I'd really appreciate that. 877-410-4321 usmedicalplan.com. Catch my entire video conversation with John if you want to know more about him and the kinds of things he does. We have a lengthy conversation on the front page of chrisstegall.com. Just a quick question as I was grabbing coffee this morning. Um, I thought I overheard two employees talking amongst themselves because of the volume of the conversation. That's what I thought I heard. Guy going, well, I don't care if she says so. I, I, it wasn't my fault, and I didn't have anything to do with it, and you're just going to have to tell her that that wasn't me. And it, like He's really protesting loud. I thought, wow, these employees are wound up for this time of day. And I look over my shoulder. Uh, the guy's got uh, whoever it is he's shouting at on speakerphone at, at 4 in the morning. Uh, he, he's shouting at someone on speakerphone, and they're not drunk or anything. It's a perfectly cogent conversation. He must be some sort of third shift worker or something just bellowing into his phone and and has whoever it is he's arguing with on speaker, just having a full-blown, outright, out loud for all to hear conversation. H- how often do you encounter people doing that? Is that a relatively common thing these days? All the time. All the time. Do people just not care that everyone around them hears their personal conversations? Is that a, is that a lack of self-awareness? Is that a indifference to the conversation they're having being heard because 
I'm a relatively private person when not doing this. I would never in a million years dream of broadcasting the phone conversation on speaker that I'm having with anyone, even if it's benign. Like, what are we having for dinner tonight? I can't imagine, you know, my wife's voice carrying through the establishment while I'm saying, no, I don't want chicken again. Let's go with burgers tonight. What, what it, can you just talk to me about the psychology of the person who puts the other, the receiving end of the call on speaker and bellows as they go about their business in the store? What is the psychology there, do you suppose? Oh, uh, psychology, I, I, I don't know, but I do know that they don't care that you can. It's, it's not that the conversation is benign. It could be the most serious conversation <laughs> that they could be talking about jobs, children, life, family. He was whatever. agitated. He was clearly agitated, protesting. Like, oh, I don't care. I didn't have anything to do with it. And I'm not going to take the blame for it. That, that was actually what caught my attention was his vociferous protestation over whatever it was this other person was accusing him of doing. So, so you say they don't care, and I say, I stipulate that, but is that a, is that arrogance? Is that self-involvement? Is that laziness? Is that a cultural thing? I, phone calls used to be, <laughs> I thought, a relatively private one-to-one -one thing. Now they're just broadcast for all to consume, and I... And he wasn't a young man either, by the way. I would say he was a man around my age, probably in his 40s. It wasn't like a kid. And by the way, I don't think kids even do calls anymore. I think kids almost refuse to use a physical phone. It's text or don't bother me. And even with texts, getting a response text is tough. Like texting is too much for kids now to, to interact with most adults. So I don't think it's young people. I think it's people our age, Fast Eddie. That's the phenomenon I don't understand. Maybe that was in one of those, um, is it Geico or Progressive? The one with Dr. Rick teaching parents not to be their kids. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, their uh, parents. Yeah, that's, um, is that Allstate? No, I think it's like Progressive or something. Progressive, progressive. yes, yes, yes. But Dr. Rick is teaching adults not to become their parents. And I think there was one where they're walking through a Costco or a... BJ's or a Sam's Club or something talking on the speaker. Is that is that is it is it old people and their unawareness or laziness? So if I'm I'm Gen Y, what is it Gen X? I do think it's Gen Xers. To be honest, that I can't that would say be me. that I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> mm. There was a period of time. Do you remember the early cell phones? And it was like a walkie-talkie. Do you, did you ever remember those guys that would walk around? Oh. Uh, hi, Nextel. I'm, was it Nextel? <laughs> yeah. Burp. Hey, I'm going over to the store. You need anything? Burp. Burp. No, I'm good. Uh, maybe some milk, but that'll be... Burp. Those guys. They thought everything was a walkie-talkie. Was it those that taught people uh, my age to start talking on speaker? It could be that that younger... So that would be the younger... <laughs> end of the spectrum the Gen of X the cell young. phone speaker talker. The young Gen Xer. Okay, I'm going to lay this at the feet of my generation. That has to stop. On behalf of people who are decent and civilized and not morons and value privacy, st stop stop broadcasting your conversations on speakerphone in stores. No one and I don't care how benign the conversation. Stop it. Take Take it off speaker. And by the way, you're not saving any time. Like you're not What's the step you're saving? So this guy, it was so loud and obnoxious, I actually turn around to look like I'm going to, I'm never going to really address it, but I turn around as if to give him a stern, I don't approve look, you know? And I look over my shoulder, he's grabbing a jug of something out of the cooler, and he's holding it like a pizza. He's got this giant phone he's holding in his palm like a pizza. Yeah, I told her she can blah, 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 blah. And the woman on the other end, yeah, well, she could just stick it where the sun don't shine. Cause I don't. So he's holding it to his mouth like a pizza box while removing the jug from the cooler. I'm like, what step are you saving versus putting her off speaker and holding it to your head? You know, like even if you had it in a lanyard around your neck and, and were on speaker, I'd go, well, okay, you're saving a step there or you're freeing up a hand. You're not even freeing a hand. Get a Bluetooth or so, 
And as kind of silly as I think people walking around looking like cyborgs with things stuck in their ear all day, uh, I'd rather that than the guy holding his phone like a pizza to his mouth. I don't know, fast, Eddie. <laughs> all week I feel like I've been that guy, talking about dress codes and phone conduct. I'm like the high school principal all of a sudden. <laughs> but I, I, I don't understand the public conversation, though. That is something I never, I guess every time, see, see you and I are, are different in that way. So I'd be in line and just be like, okay, well, that's weird. And I'd be like, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> but, you, but you actually, and rightly, want to know, like, all right, what is that? What is to that? What's the psychology behind that? I'm just, a, I'm a relatively private person person about my personal conversations whatever they are again even if it's silly like uh, you want me to pick up a six-pack before the tailgate right. that, that still doesn't feel like something i want everyone in my sphere to hear but there is something psychological about people that now they just don't care they don't care if their entire lives are just brought it, maybe it's online is it uh, i don't like i have to think on that is it the advent of the reality show is it uh youtube Social media. <laughs> speaking of while we're at it, speaking of uh, YouTube, Russell Brand, not a guy I care even a minute about, not losing any sleep about the guy. I don't misunderstand. This is a story that uh, matters deeply to me. It doesn't. I don't know him and I don't care. So having said all that, I do care that YouTube has already decided that the guy is guilty of rape. This is, um, you know, so we're moving into this era where obviously not not telling you anything you don't understand. Um, the way we're consuming information and news is diversifying. And people that bring you commentary and news, people that do what I do, everybody's diversifying. They maybe don't have an employer formally anymore. Now they're going to places like YouTube and social media, and they're creating their own products, and they're selling their own products on these platforms and making their livings that way. Russell Brand, I guess, has been making a pretty healthy living off of his, what, podcast? Is it a podcast he does or YouTube show? I, I, I haven't seen or listened to a minute of it, to be clear, so I don't, I don't know. L like everything, Chris, it's just it is a podcast, but yes, it's all on video. On video. It's a, all right. Yeah. YouTube, I mean, again, I'm, I have video of this show. You can go watch on YouTube and Rumble, and I forget. And every now and again, I'll get a note from somebody that goes, hey, I saw you on Rumble and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I forgot we do that. Because I, I am just hardwired after... 25 years of doing audio as a medium, it is really, really hard for me to, com to, to understand or process the fact that some people would prefer to watch YouTube while listening. I don't get it, but okay, that's you. God bless you. Glad you're there. Thank you, however you consume the show. <laughs> it's just not something I think about. But we are on YouTube and Rumble if you want to watch this for whatever reason. I, I couldn't understand it, but thank you that you do. Um, but I'm told some people just like the the live video. They're not even watching. And it's not a matter of sitting and watching me talking. They just, that's the way they prefer to listen to things while the video is rolling. You heard this? Y yes, Chris. And actually, I, for the first time in my life, I experienced it and actually enjoyed it. My friends sent, um, I guess you would call them sermons. Yes. But uh, preaching from one of the Catholic priests. And I actually started listening to it. But it's not like on Spotify or anywhere else. It's on YouTube. Oh, yeah. So I just kind of leave that running <laughs> while I'm driving. But and, you're not you're watching running. it. You're just listening. I'm not. Yeah. Now, it, but but if if I sent this is curious. <laughs> if, if I if is that is that called a homily in your church? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if I sent you a homily and I said, "Here, Fast Eddie, here's the homily from the priest this Sunday." You can listen to it in this podcast file form, or here's the video uh, on YouTube. Exact same audio. Which file would you click on while driving? I, I I'd probably the YouTube. You would. Yeah. How intriguing! And wh <laughs> why do you think you'd make that decision? I guess it was just kind of trained. I almost as if I figured out a trick back before Spotify and Apple Music and all that stuff. It was like, wow, you can do this easily. You just click it and. But you said even we, Big Ed, your dad, you'll go in and catch him watching videos and is he like watching them or he's listening to the video that happens to be playing he's a watcher he's he's a viewer he watches sure. yes so he's a guy that if he clicked on my show on youtube he would sit and watch me talking yep all right that's a generational thing too i'm gonna have to figure out <laughs>
this whole feels this whole week feels like I'm a high school principal. What are you kids up to in your dungarees? Uh, anyway, the gap. What's that? You're bridging the gap right. between generations this week, Chris. <laughs> well, Russell Brand, they have decided to uh, try, hang, and convict, or whatever, in which order, it doesn't matter. YouTube has moved to prevent British comedian and internet uh, commentator Russell Brand from making money through his YouTube channel this week following allegations. Allegations from multiple women. He sexually assaulted them more than a decade ago. The online platform announced... Yesterday, they have suspended monetization for Brand's channel, citing the creator's off-platform behavior, violating YouTube policy. So again, welcome to the brave new world where, it's true, broadcasters, traditional broadcasters, uh, cable news, radio and television broadcasters are no longer the main driver and employer of people who create content that you may listen to or watch. Uh, now it's become a diversified panoply of people like Russell Brand and others who are hosting their own YouTube shows and monetizing it that way. However, there's a new boss, a bigger boss, and a more sinister boss. And it's called Big Tech. And for whatever lack of diversity traditional broadcast ownership groups gave you, in the new era of diverse messages out there in big tech land, there are fewer people making decisions as to whether or not your voice can be heard. So it's actually interesting. For as diversified as the voices are, if you follow this, as many options as there are to you out there, there are actually, there's a, there's a smaller body of people making decisions as to whether or not those voices you listen to can make money. It's kind of spooky, isn't it? When you think about it, so you so you say to yourself, "Oh, that's exciting! There's there's more voices out there on YouTube and podcasts than ever before." True. There's also smaller and smaller numbers of people who make the decision as to whether or not you can hear them, or whether they can earn a living. So, are we better or worse, Fast Eddie? Is that better or worse? <sighs> more voices, fewer bosses. Fewer voices, more bosses. <laughs> I, I, I like the more voices, fewer bosses. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, unfortunately, there's only uh, one one or the other. You know, I, yeah. I mean, I. Um, so I, here's what I would tell you: I actually believe that if Russell Brand had a show on Salem right now, my employer, I think Russell Brand. I, well, I know. I don't think I know. If I were accused of something awful like that, I don't. I don't think. Salem would throw me off of the show and say, I can't earn a living anymore until I've been tried and convicted. I would like to believe that the company that I work for would say, well, you've been accused of something, but we can't very well take your living from you. Um, Now, I suppose if a prolonged court hearing or something takes me away from the job, maybe you'd have to have a conversation about that. Like, well, you're not able to perform your job anymore. That's become an interruption. Maybe then. How many people lose their jobs simply because they've been accused in their private lives of some bad behavior? Is that very commonplace? You ever heard of somebody? Sincere question, and maybe the answer is yes. I can't think of one. You ever heard of an employee? I mean, Lord knows teachers unions exist to protect unions in general, protect people whenever they're accused of some awful stuff, stuff that people have been guilty of. I mean, how many stories have we heard over the years of government employees Teachers union types who've done heinous things and their unions don't let the school district touch them. But boy, you a woman so much as step forward and accuse a guy of rape now and YouTube says, well, that's enough for us. You're done making money here. That's a scary new world I don't want to live in. And I don't know, maybe the guy, Megan Kelly was flipping her lid on this yesterday. She was, she's got a uh, a clip flying around out there on social media right now of her just screeching. She's furious at people like me who have instantly assumed that Russell Brand is not guilty of rape. I don't know. I don't know that he's not. All I said was, it's interesting that this is a deck. Apparently this, this Russ, I don't even know. Is he, is he considered a comedian or an actor? The last thing that I knew meaningful about Russell Brand was that he was with Katy Perry. And that was, Probably a decade ago itself, wasn't it? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he is. He's a comedian actor. Like Br- British I, I guy. Him f- yes. Looks like a wet chihuahua. <laughs> yeah. Looks like you drag him out of a drain somewhere. He, it, <laughs> I never understood. I thought Katy Perry, once upon a time, was one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. And when I found out she's with this guy that looks like something you pulled out of your drain. I was like, oh, seriously? What is it? With, it's like when Julia Roberts in her peak was with Lyle Lovett. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but at any rate, uh, but he's been, you know, in the last, what, I think since COVID, a, a lot of conservative voices, and I think we have a couple of times on this show, have played things he said because he's largely always been considered at least a leftist or a, you know, when you come from entertainment and comedy, pop culture, it's pretty rare to find somebody that sounds like they're limited government or questioning government or questioning authority these days. And so oftentimes when someone with some kind of famous name starts to make a name for themselves by being somewhat anti-establishment, and today anti-establishment means being anti-government or questioning authoritarianism or questioning shots, which Russell Brand has been doing, now all of a sudden he's been embraced by conservatives. And so my theory yesterday was, well, naturally now, 10 years later, women are coming forward and saying he's a rapist because conservatives have embraced him. And, and I think it's been a pretty running theme that whenever people of pop culture begin to start sounding even somewhat libertarian or even flirting with being middle of the road or even kind of sound like maybe some things they say could be conservative and maybe even, dare I say, pro-Trump. I mean, go down the list of people who were always considered reliable stalwarts of the left. We could do it all morning, I'm sure, and many more I'm not going to think of, that once they started to sound like they questioned authoritarianism, once they sounded like they had stepped outside the Democrat Party politics that everybody assumed they always supported, and shows like this one started playing them and going, hey, Listen to what they said here. This is interesting and not at all what leftists are saying right now. The minute guys like me start highlighting these people that we assume were former leftists, well, then it's a search and destroy mission. One of the most famous and gifted and hilarious comics there is, in my view, Dave Chappelle, was never... I mean, there, there was never a thing that the left thought wrong about Dave Chappelle until he started doing trans comedy. A- and then Dave Chappelle became an enemy, a public enemy. Comics are probably the, the biggest example of this. Comics are generally, if they're doing their job well, they're truth tellers. So you could probably tick off a list of at least a half a dozen off the top of your head of people who are in comedy who have gravitated toward a conservative message or at least an independent or libertarian or questioning message and had their careers savaged because of it. Some of them destroyed. Many of them have been successful enough and made careers and their money before they started to get an independent voice. And so you really can't do them damage. It's like Rush used to say, you didn't make me, you're not going to be able to break me. So some of these people had established careers beforehand. You can tell the difference. People that are like, I got so much money and I'm so famous and successful. I'll say what I want and you can object all you want and I don't care. You can't touch me. Russell Brand, I don't know. How famous is Russell Brand? How wealthy do you suppose Russell Brand is? I don't know. He's making money on YouTube, so I can't imagine he's just rolling in dough. No, no, but at the time he was dating Katy Perry, he was was pretty big. Like, I mean, I remember, uh, what was it? Forgetting Sarah Marshall comes to mind. Like, he was in that movie. That was... Like he was uh, get him to the Greek like that. He he was in Hollywood films back then. Well, Megyn Kelly says that people like me, she's ticked off yesterday because people like me are assuming that these women aren't telling the truth. I don't I don't really care if it if it turns out that the rape charge or the sexual assault charges fall apart. You're 31 years old and you have sex allegedly over a three month period with a 16 year old. We're done. 
Mm. I'm unsubscribing, all right? And I am sick of conservatives online trying to defend that as though she had a role in it. She was a minor. Just because you can't be prosecuted mm. for it doesn't mean it's right. The conservative men I know are lovely. They're ethical. They're honorable. It's not to say they've never fallen down in their lives, but in no world would they be taking advantage of a 16-year-old mm. minor. I have a daughter who's four years away from that. You come anywhere near her as a 31-year-old man, and we are going to have a yeah. serious problem. And it's not yeah. going to be over whether you get demonetized on YouTube. Yes. I really hope my friends and the conservative side of the aisle would remember just because we're all over Me Too, and it was an overreaction, and it went too far, and it got politicized, doesn't mean that we have to knee-jerk defend every scumbag who gets no. accused of bad behavior. Uh, well, of course, sh she's right. Um, I don't know Russell Brand or his character, and I'm not knee-jerk defending him because I don't know the man. Um, what I, two things can be true at the same time, though. There are a history of people who have aligned with conservatives or had shows that have trended conservative who have had salacious allegations thrown at them and been destroyed. That is a true statement. There is a history of people who were once cons considered reliably liberal who then surprised everybody by sounding not at all liberal, and then the world collapsed on them. There's a history of that, a demonstrable history of that. We've talked about it for years on this show. So um, I'm not going to give the culture the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> um, I have too long a history with people like Russell Brand being savaged because they're not towing the line. Now, having said that, I have no in emotional investment in the guy. This is the same thing as Lauren Boebert. I don't, I don't have emotional investment in these people. I've also said that I caution our side in lovingly wrapping our arms around every person that we formerly thought was a left winger. And because they have a show or two where they say something that sounds not liberal or maybe even sort of conservative in nature or limited government or questioning in nature, have I not? How many shows have I said? Careful, careful. We take the thing they said in this moment and we use it and we embrace it, but we're not whole hog throwing our arms around the person and saying, they're in our camp now. They're one of us. We love them. We're going to listen to them all the time now. You know, like Joe Rogan, fine guy. I can't take a success from him. Number one podcaster in the world. Do I think Joe Rogan is some Trump voting conservative? I, I, I don't. Actually, from what I understand, Joe Rogan doesn't even want to have Trump on. Like Trump's physically asking Joe Rogan to come on the show and Rogan won't do it. it is what I hear. I mean, whatever. So like this idea that Joe Rogan's a big conservative now out there using his number one platform in the world to advance conservatism. I, I don't think so. And, and let's go down the list. Bill Maher, Dave Portnoy, Dave Chappelle, uh, Bill Burr, uh, <coughs> Russell Brand. All of these guys have said things that I've played on the show and gone right on. I'll use it. That doesn't make them one of us. So, okay. I don't know him. He said a couple of interesting things. Frankly, I find him difficult to listen to. He speaks at such a cadence and such a stream of consciousness. I, I, I have a hard time following him. Again, maybe it's the old guy in me. I like people to kind of ruminate on a thought or two at, at once rather than just bing, 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 bing. It's like listening to a pinball, listening to him with a British accent. So it's difficult for me to follow him. But he said some interesting things where we've played it here, but I didn't go, oh, all right. Oh, he's come home. He's one of us. Yes, let's put him on the Mount Rushmore of conservatism. Okay, so uh, he's diddled a 16-year-old. Pretty gross if true. I guess it's true. I don't know. Rape? I don't know. But you see, here's the thing. I was never invested in him in the begin in, to begin with. But it's also true that when guys like this stray from the reservation and start making a living on places like YouTube, now the whole left-wing community has decided he's illegitimate and can't be heard and he must be deplatformed. And maybe YouTube was looking for a reason. They seem to have gotten one. So they've tried and convicted him from making a living at YouTube before he's ever had a fair, fair hearing in court. So no knee-jerk here, folks. If there's one thing I am not, it is knee-jerk. Jerk, maybe. No knee.
Hey there, it's Chris, back on the phone with my dentist and friend, Bob Spinato at Williamsburg Dental in Broomall, Pennsylvania, just off the blue route with new technology. You have not just new associates, but they brought new technology into the business to make it a little easier for patients. Yeah, it's a very exciting time in dentistry. We have now introduced a three-dimensional x-ray called a CBCT scan in our office, which allows us to diagnose and things earlier for patients. My daughter is placing a lot of implants in the past that referred out. Uh, it's now being done in-house. And we also, uh, we've been using dental or computer scanners for taking impressions for crowns for about the last two to three years. We now have introduced the next step, which is a milling machine, and we can uh, now make crowns in the office. Things can be completed in the same day as opposed to having a, a temporary crown put on and three weeks later coming back and having a permanent crown put on. It's really a game changer, and it's a time saver for our patients to not have to make multiple visits to the office. Pick up the phone or go online, make that appointment, 610-353-2700 or williamsburg-dental.com. Ray Epps, ladies and gentlemen, has been charged by the Department of Justice. Epps charged with one misdemeanor count of disorderly or disruptive conduct on restricted grounds. Charged by um, suggesting he plans to enter a plea deal. uh, Not long after he was charged, a virtual plea agreement hearing was set for Wednesday. The criminal information charges that Epps did knowingly and with intent to impede and disrupt the orderly conduct of government business and official functions engage in disorderly and disruptive conduct in and within such proximity to restricted building and grounds, that is, any posted, cordoned off, or otherwise restricted area within the United States Capitol and its grounds where the vice president was and would be temporarily visiting, blah, 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 blah. Most of the thousands who unlawfully gathered on the restricted grounds of the Capitol have not been charged unless they engaged in some sort of aggravating conduct like attacking police. Well, that's not true. I know that's not true. Julie Kelly will immediately disabuse NBC News of that. Most of the thousands of who unlawfully gathered on restricted grounds have not been charged. Most true. But the idea that everyone in custody engaged in aggravating conduct? They just sentenced a guy to 22 years in prison and he wasn't even physically there on January 6th. What a bogus story, which leads me to believe that this is a lot like the Hunter Biden gun charge, folks. Ray Epps has been a big source of hypocrisy for the DOJ because there's so much footage of him stoking and animating. And, of course, he's been long accused of being a fed plant. They never laid a glove on him, but for two days he was running around Washington, D.C., stoking the crowd, telling them, hey, We're going to storm in that place. Let's go. Let's go. And remember, there were people around him going, don't listen to him. He's a fed. You should go. If you've never seen the Ray Epps videos, you should go watch them. It's very interesting. January 5th, the day before, he's walking around the streets of Washington, D.C. in these pro-Trump crowds going, hey, tomorrow we storm the Capitol. Come on. Who's with me? And he, he keeps trying to gin everybody up. He's a really tall guy. So he kind of stands out in the crowd. And as he keeps shouting loudly over everybody, we're going to storm the Capitol tomorrow. You start hearing Trumpists saying, no, no, don't listen to that guy. And he keeps shouting, no, no, come on, we're going to storm the Capitol. And at some point, a couple of guys in the crowd start chanting, fed, fed, fed. And the whole crowd surrounds Ray Epps and starts chanting, fed, 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 because There were so many people on January 5th and 6th who were there to support Trump and oppose the certification of that election. They knew. We got those calls. Very sophisticated, these people. You know, everybody makes them out to be hillbillies and hicks or whatever. They're not. They knew what they were there to do. And they knew that the feds were there to stoke violence. And we got calls from people that said there were people in all black and people with backpacks and people that did not look like us that were causing trouble and shoving and we were actually trying to stop them from care so everyone assumed because ray epps is not he's no one's touched him there's all this video of him actively trying to stoke the crowd and then on january 6th the day of he's there at the bike racks with the cops and he's going let's go let's charge the bastards let's run in there never so much as a wrist slap. 
over these last two years. So Ray Epps has been this constant source because there's so much video of him. What's the deal with him? Why has no one ever charged him with anything? So color me dubious when I hear that the DOJ yesterday has decided to surface now with a misdemeanor charge. Doesn't this feel a lot like Hunter Biden's been charged with gun crimes? It, it, it feels to me like the DOJ is trying to kind of throw a little bone here and throw a little bone there to kind of throw you off the tray. Oh, no, no, we're all above board here at DOJ. Justice is blind. Yeah, President's son, gun charge. Yeah, Ray Epps, oh, yeah, you're right. We're concerned about him too. Misdemeanor. They're just, they're kind of trying to take away things that look brazenly obvious that there's a two-tiered system of justice. Ray Epps and Hunter Biden are two symbols, two of the most flagrantly obvious symbols of a two-tiered justice system that are out there today. And we keep pointing at them. And the bowling alley waitress knows that. And so they said, we got to do something here. All right, gun charge misdemeanor. And now, if you bring up Hunter Biden or Ray Epps, they'll go, well, what? They've been charged. They've been charged. They've been treated just like you and me. That's what they'll do, Fast Eddie. Nothing to talk about anymore. <laughs> it's it's just unbelievable because, I, yes, the charge in itself is a misdemeanor. Yeah. You have like 70-year-old people going to jail for like 40 years. For walking through the building. <laughs> for walking. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. This guy, we have to go into the Capitol. <laughs> yeah, for two days. <laughs> stoking people, encouraging them, telling them what they got to go. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> it's so insulting. Thinking people know it. Matt Gates says he is going to do everything he can to stop a continuing resolution. That is a budget deal to avert a shutdown. He says, I'm not going to continue to spend more money. We're not going to just Band-Aid over this thing. We're going to deal with it now because we have the Republican majority in the House. We have the power of the purse. No, I'm not going along with a continuing resolution. You're starting to hear, before we get to Gates, uh, give me some of uh, Glitch McConnell stealing that from our friend Emerald. I liked that. Um, This is one of his lucid moments where his jaw doesn't lock and he's not staring off into space. To see what the House is going to do on a uh, continuing resolution. I think all of you know I'm not a fan of government shutdowns. I've seen a few of them over the years. They never have produced a policy change, and they've always been a loser for Republicans uh, politically. Yeah. So give the Democrats what they want, increase and continue to spend wildlessly and recklessly. Uh, and uh, if you try to do a government shutdown, it never ends in our favor. Republicans are always losers, so just keep behaving like a Democrat. Is Glitch McConnell's counsel? Matt Gates having none of it. Mr. Speaker, I'm not voting for a continuing resolution. I'm not voting to continue the failure and the waste and the corruption and the election interference, and in some cases, the efforts that could lead this country into World War III. I oppose the CR authored by my friend and colleague from Florida, Byron Donalds. The Donald CR continues the Ukraine policy negotiated by Speaker Pelosi and Mitch McConnell in the omnibus that conservatives were against. The Donald CR is a permission slip for Jack Smith to continue his election interference as they are trying to gag the president, the former president of the United States and the leading contender for the Republican nomination, and the Donald CR abandons the principle that it is only a review of single subject spending bills that will save this country and allow us to tweeze through these programs and force these agencies to stand up and defend their budget. My friends, we are approaching the days where we're facing $2 trillion annual deficits atop a $33 trillion debt. This is unsustainable. And just to continue things, with some facial 8% cut over 30 days that will lead to no programmatic reform is an insult to the principles we fought for in January. Now, Byron Donalds is also a Florida Florida congressman. Matt Gates, Florida congressman. Byron Donalds, Florida congressman. It's not often that you see members of the same delegation from the same state locking horns, but Gates and Donalds are. Byron Donalds is a big Trump guy, is he not? He is, yeah. All right. Take a listen to Donalds responding. 
Your fellow Floridian, Matt Gates, is out here telling us yeah. he's working to develop a coalition to, quote, defeat the Donald's CR. What do you make of that? I would challenge my colleague from Florida to create a coalition that tries to actually get a victory for the American people. If he wants to have a personal thing with me going back and forth, he's entitled to. But I don't care about that foolishness. I want to win. Your colleagues who said they want to see Oh, and by the way. No, leave it. I'll leave that for you. No, no, no. Come back. No, 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 no. He went on to talk about Zelensky visiting at the U.N. yesterday specifically. What is your message to Zelensky when he comes to the Capitol on Thursday? He wants more money from Congress. He claims that it's, you know, he says it's very important to stopping the war in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. What message does it send that so many conservatives are opposed to more money for Ukraine? Uh, the first thing I'll tell you is there's no money in the House right now for Ukraine. There's just not, it's not there. Um, you mean like, there's no support for money? No. And to be blunt, we're running a $2 trillion deficit. Any money we give to Ukraine, we're borrowing from our future. That's the facts. Those are the truth. You can, anybody, you feel how you want to feel about it. I'm here to tell you what's right and what's real. Uh, I mean, look, it's not a good time for him to be here, quite frankly. Um, that's just the reality. And the third piece is what's happened with Ukraine is, frankly, the fault of leadership of Joe Biden. Let's be very clear of that. So do not, don't put that on the backs of the American people now. If we had a commander in chief who knew how to lead as opposed to take naps, then we would be in a much better situation when it comes to Ukraine and global security, for that matter. <laughs> so... Um... What's true there between Gates and uh, Donalds? We'll continue to dig a little bit. I tend to side with Gates here. As for Zelensky, he gave a speech yesterday at the UN, which I'm not interested in playing and I don't care anything about, other than to say at one point he actually invokes climate change. And I quote, humanity is failing on its climate policy objectives. So supposedly this man is inches from being swallowed whole by Russia. And he's going before the global community to plead for help with being taken over from Russia. And figures out a way to sideline those comments and concerns for a little bit to talk about the failing of humanity on climate policy objectives. You get the sense that that's not a very serious guy leading a very serious movement. Do you have any time, like if you're truly leading your nation from being swallowed whole by an invading nation and you're speaking before the global body, do you have time to talk about anything else? Anything. I mean, I don't, I don't care how severe. Cancer, climate, space exploration, China, monetary policy, name it, pick it. Do you talk about anything else but the invading force to your east? I, I, I don't think I would. It, it's very difficult to take Vladimir Zelensky seriously when he sounds like John Kerry at the UN. Sorry. The beady-eyed John Kirby, the deputy spokesmouth there at the White House, he comes from the Pentagon, I think, originally. Uh, he's now somehow inexplicably the number two man to um, the most inarticulate dummy we've ever seen at the White House podium, Pepe Le Pew. Corrine hyphen John hyphen Pierre hyphen 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 hyphen. Uh, she's got all the hyphens and all the lesbianism and all the race and all the blah, blah, blah that makes her historic or something. But she's a stone cold dummy. John Kirby's smart, but a little too perfect for my taste. But anyway, uh, he's the number two guy for some reason. He's actually out there today saying, Tommy Tuberville is an outrage for standing in the way of all of these important military appointments. We just lost... An F-35 jet, you beady-eyed little twerp. So in between pressing your pocket square and quaffing your hair perfectly and your tortoiseshell glasses and everything from your central casting fakery, how about you first, let's focus on why the Marines have had to ground their aircraft for two days and have a discussion about how we lost an F-35. And then we'll talk about Tommy Tuberville keeping certain military appointments from happening. I mean, how about in that order? Just just me. All right, let's go to my favorite name in all of guest names. Hans von Spakovsky, the greatest guest name ever. We don't have him on nearly enough. Hans von Spakovsky is an election law reform leader and senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He's authored a book, co-authored a book called Our Broken Elections, How the Left Changed the Way You Vote. Hans, welcome back to the show. 
Well, thanks for having me back. And, and by the way, uh, every, uh, you know, the media keeps saying, oh, Senator Tuberville is preventing um, uh, military promotion. No, he's not. No. He hasn't put a hold on them. All he's doing is refusing to agree to unanimous consent. What that means is, is that um, he's requiring senators to do, oh, my gosh, actually go to the floor of the Senate <laughs> to have a debate and then a vote on each of the promotions. Isn't that horrible that senators would have to show up on the floor of the Senate? Well, listen, we've even made it easier for the senators now. They can wear their gym shorts and hoodies. So they, <laughs> right. they can do it in comfort, Hans. Uh, glad to have you here today. Something piqued our interest yesterday. It was National Voter Registration Day. There was a big party going on over at MSNBC, and uh, the guest of honor was Pennsylvania's very own Josh Shapiro, who was very excited, and he spent his whole day yesterday on social media crowing about this great new thing in Pennsylvania that's happening. Uh, are you breathing in and out? Did you show up at the DMV? Guess what? You're now registered to vote. Here's Shapiro, Hans. Take a listen. Joining us now, Pennsylvania's Democratic Governor Josh Shapiro. This morning, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania oh. is marking National Voter Registration Day by becoming the 24th U.S. state to enact automatic registration. Ooh. Governor, thanks so much for being with us. Tell us about how Pennsylvania is making it easier to vote. Why are they so excited? Ask yourself, why? Well, look, now when you go to the DMV to get a driver's license, renew your driver's license, Joe, you'll be able to automatically get registered to vote unless you choose to opt out. Um, <laughs> there's about 1.7 million Pennsylvanians Democrats. who are eligible to vote but yeah. aren't registered. This is a safe, <laughs> secure, safe, streamlined secure. way to be able to get them to register and get them to participate in our democracy. Get them to How participate. How many more voters do you think you'll get registered, that you'll get to the table through this process? Whoops, Just from I mean, what we've get, learned get to from the other table, states not for you, I mean. Look, we'll, we'll see, Mika, and we'll certainly report back, but our Secretary of State believes that we'll have tens of thousands of new registrants <laughs> in the first year. Um, we'll certainly track it and see how it goes. All right, the that's key enough. Issue here I mean, is what, what's hilarious is their giddiness, and, and in fact, Mika gave up the ghost there for a minute. How many votes do you think you're going to get out of this, Josh? I, I mean, how many voters do you think will come to the table and participate in our democracy now, Josh? Hans... Everybody understands what this is, but you take it from here. What are we hearing here? Well, Bo, keep in mind that um, in Pennsylvania, if you are an alien and you're in the country legally, you can get a driver's license. <laughs> and I think it was just this past April, right, that Pen the Democrats in the Pennsylvania legislature proposed extending the ability to get a driver's license to illegal aliens. Now, Everybody uh, seems to have forgotten. Remember uh, in 2017, so just it wasn't that long ago, Pedro Cortez, the Secretary of State of Pennsylvania, was forced to resign after it came out that uh, because of a glitch at the Pennsylvania DMV, literally thousands of aliens had gotten registered to vote and Pennsylvania state government officials didn't realize it was happening. And he was forced to resign. And ever since then, the government of the state has refused to say, well, how many aliens got registered and how many were voting? The estimates were that at least, at least 10,000 Aliens had gotten registered because of this glitch in the DMV system. Uh, but, you know, there's still an ongoing lawsuit because the government refuses to say, well, how many illegal votes were cast because of how the Pennsylvania DMV screwed up the system. And now they want to, rather than asking people when they get their license, whether they want to uh, uh, register to vote now, they're just going to do it without even asking them. There's no point to that. People have the ability to register. But I can tell you, uh, given how poorly the DMV has handled this in the past, uh, I have no doubt that, that aliens are going to get registered again. Everyone understands as well that it's to Democrats' benefit. Here's what Democrats will say. You know, I called this out yesterday quite a bit on social media, and the left was particularly hostile. Uh, because they've been caught, 
and they don't like being called out. They always say these stupid platitudes like, well, you, just, you just like making it harder for people to vote. That's always what they say when you object to their schemes. Why do you want to make it harder for people to vote? And I say, I don't, I don't want to make it harder, but let's just call this what it is. You guys know that as long as there's a bunch of warm bodies on the rolls, it's to your advantage. And, and, and like, good for you. I, I don't, as I say, I don't hate the players. I hate the game. Um, good for them. They figured out how to game this thing out. They want warm bodies on the voter rolls, whatever they got to do to get the warm bodies, because that, that will be to their favor. And now when you walk out from there, Hans, what we mean by that, I suppose different people have different theories on how they get there. Um, I don't know where you go with that, but let's just be honest. When there are thousands, if not millions of people on voter rolls who don't cast ballots, that always seems to work out in the Democrats' favor. That's all I'll say about that. You take it from there. Well, I'll just tell you that uh, the, the history of automatic voter registration in the states that have put it in, like California, is that uh, they don't do it very well. They don't pay attention. They just automatically register everyone, even when the DMV folks know that the person isn't eligible uh, to vote. And they have found lots and lots of aliens being registered in places like Illinois and California. And that's 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 part of what's going on here. Remember, the, the push by the left is to give extend the right to vote to aliens, whether they're here legally or not. You know, New York's already uh, done that, and other places are doing it. I'm sure Philly wants to do it, too, because they think it helps them vote. So they're basically, they're diminishing. They're diminishing the right to vote for U.S. citizens with, with everything they're doing. And again, I, I, you, maybe you won't go this far, but it's very, very abundantly clear to me that when you have voter rolls full of people who don't vote or aliens, Democrats will figure out a way that those people get their vote cast one way or the other. Now, however, however, again, however you want to backfill that, however you get to that place, uh, I'll let others. Lots of people have theories, but but it, it's just undeniably true to me that these days of us going to the polls and casting our votes, that no longer matters. Now there's this ground game leading up to Election Day of vote harvesting, and I'm sorry, that's the least transparent thing I've ever heard of, but Republicans are going to have to figure out how to get better at it. Yeah, it's the, the left calls it vote harvesting because that sounds so good. It's actually vote trafficking because that's what's going on. Uh, and there are numerous instances of uh, absentee ballot fraud occurring uh, through that process, including, by the way, unfortunately, in in Pennsylvania, uh, we have literally dozens, dozens of proven cases of voter fraud uh, in Pennsylvania on the Heritage Foundation's um, election fraud database. And so anyone who thinks that's not going on, you can take a look at our database and you'll find case after case of that. Hans, what's the answer here? I mean, you know, as much as I hate it, as much as I wish election day was election day, one person, one vote with ID, paper ballot, that's my feeling about it. But okay, that, that day's gone. The horse is out of the barn. So we have virtually two months ahead of election day in states like Pennsylvania. Republicans have got to get better at figuring out how to step up here. Um, Dick Morris once said to me, Republicans have their couch potatoes, too. Republicans have got to go out there and figure out how to find these people who have either requested these ballots early or are on the rolls and don't vote. That's the only answer, right? Well, yeah, look, what I say to folks is you play by the rules that are in place wherever you are. That doesn't mean that you don't keep trying to make the rules better. Uh, on early voting, for example, um, polling shows that, you know, people, people overwhelmingly like early voting. But but the polling also shows they don't want it extending more than two weeks before Election Day. Yeah, that makes it much more manageable. And it's when it's it's when early voting extends to a month, two months before Election Day. That you run into all kinds of potential problems on absentee ballots. Look, there's all kinds of things to do with that, including requiring like Georgia and Texas do. You to uh, 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 submit 
an ID with your absentee ballot. That's one way of, of cutting down on absentee ballot fraud. And states like Georgia and, and Texas have put in a requirement like that very successfully. And, of course, in Pennsylvania, we have a Supreme Court that won't even require signature verification, never mind IDs. Uh, yeah, uh, right. And that's a product of, frankly, you, you, your state, I hate to tell you this, you've got some of the worst. Uh, Supreme Court state judges of any state in the country. And what needs to happen is uh, you, you need to get them replaced with actually good judges who are willing to follow the law and actually follow the Constitution. How defeated is Hans von Spakovsky, who is uh, a pragmatic guy? How defeated, defeatist are you about the prospects of Republican victory statewide in a place like Pennsylvania now, given all the ways in which they have codified the benefit for Democrats, two months of early voting, you know, no signatures, no IDs, you know, two months worth of early voting. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of people who reach out to me, Hans, they're so defeated. They even, even when they request an early ballot, they feel like, eh, I send it in. I'm not even sure it'll be counted. I, people are really dispirited no, about no. it. No, but they shouldn't be. That just means they got, folks just have to work harder. It means that, they need to get involved in local. Remember, politics and in particular elections are all run locally. And that just means you need to get involved locally, whether it's becoming a county election official, being a poll watcher, which could make a heck of a difference. Um, and, and you just got to get involved and uh, uh, work at trying to make things better where you are. Legislature and a new governor could change the rules. I mean, I, I, I hate I hate reminding us all because it's a painful, terrible reminder that we're in this mess because of a Republican legislature and that awful Act 77. I mean, this this didn't used to be a thing until just really a couple of years ago, this two months of early voting. And that was because of a Republican legislature inexplicably, Hans. Yeah, well, I think the one thing that um, the 20... 20 election has done is it finally educated and made a lot of uh, state legislators realize the problems that I've been talking about for a long time. And I think it finally made them realize also that many of the proposals being pushed by the left were a very bad idea. They were all ideas intended yes. to undermine the security and integrity of the election process. Who has the best elections in the country, in your view, right now? Well, in fact, uh, Heritage has an election integrity scorecard in which we rate the states, and the top states in the country are places like Tennessee, Florida, and Georgia, which uh, all three states passed extensive reforms after the 2020 election to do things like extend their ID requirements to absentee ballots. I mean, that's just one of many changes they made. Hans, have, and I'll let you go with this question. Have, have uh, any candidates or campaigns reached out to you uh, or Heritage on this subject specifically? Because I, what I want to know, does the GOP at large, do state GOPs at large, and do specific campaigns like Trump and DeSantis, do they understand this problem state by state? And have they figured out the game? A lot of people are a little concerned that many of them have not. Well, I haven't talked to anybody at any of the any of the campaigns, uh, but then all of the recommendations that we make on improving election integrity are very public and up up on our up on our website. So if they want to know what they what should be done in the stage, all they have to do is <laughs> look at our website. <laughs> Hans von Spakovsky at the Heritage Foundation. He's at H von Spakovsky. And I won't spell Spakovsky for now, but you can call and I'll give it to you if you want. All right. Hans von Spakovsky on uh, X, formerly Twitter. Pleasure to catch up with you, Hans. Come back. 20 years in business. Congratulations to Mike Lindell and my pillow. 80 million pillows sold over those 20 years. Can you believe that number? Well, Mike and his team at MyPillow, they want to thank each and every one of you for giving them such success over these many years. And now they want to celebrate by giving you the lowest price in MyPillow history. He told me that if you call or log on to MyPillow.com or call them today, you'll get a queen-size MyPillow to celebrate their 20 years in business for just $19.98. 20 years and just about 20 bucks with tax. How about that? 
1998, that's it, for a queen-size MyPillow. Do you know the regular price of this thing is almost $50 more? So you're talking about a $50 discount. By the way, for the king size, you'll get it for just $10 more, $29.98. It's a huge sale. And incidentally, in addition to these pillows that are deeply discounted right now, you go to MyPillow.com and you'll get a discount using my name, Chris Podcast. Use that as your promo, promo code, Chris Podcast. Click on the uh, radio listener square and enter that. And you're talking about mattress toppers, pet beds, mattresses, my slippers, sheets, and, of course, the pillows, so much more. You can try it on. If, if uh, ever you've gone to MyPillow.com and you've thought to yourself, I, eh, maybe uh, it's a little expensive, now's the time. Celebrate 20 years with Mike Lindell. And know this, 10-day, or excuse me, 10-year warranty. 10 years they warranty these things. So if they ever wear out or you have trouble, you can exchange for brand new. 60 days they let you take this stuff home, and if you don't like it, you can send it back for a full refund. So you got nothing to lose but a great night's sleep on my pillow products. I have colleagues I've sent these my slippers to. They love them. Christine loves hers. The sheets are comfortable. The towels are super absorbent. Even old Dean loves his dog bed. And we drink my coffee here at the office every day. I just brewed some this morning. MyPillow.com, promo code Chris Podcast. all right? With that warranty fully intact, or call 800-932-5056, 800-932-5056, promo code Chris Podcast, or MyPillow.com, promo code Chris Podcast, if you please to save. John Fetterman, <laughs> the distinguished hooded mustachioed troglodyte <laughs> from Pennsylvania. <laughs> Uh, he came out yesterday with a rousing speech in support of the UAW guys. Now, remember, the UAW guys, they want to work 40 hours and get paid. Uh, they get paid 40 hours and work 32. They want 50% hike in pay, and they want fatter pensions in an industry that is being forced into manufacturing EVs and costing them billions, losing billions, cars nobody wants to buy. The auto industry is losing money hand over fist, despite, you know, this idea that the, they're making trillions and they're big corporate fat cats. The automotive industry in the United States is being destroyed on purpose. And the fact that the left, people like Obama and Fetterman are out agitating for union workers, it, it tells you all you need to know. They're destroying the auto industry on purpose. This singular focus, remember, day one was always fossil fuels. Day one for this Husk's administration was shut down the Keystone Pipeline. Go back and research the auto bailout of the early 2000s, and you will find, um, if you look for it, I'll never forget it as long as I live, it was during the bank bailout and the auto bailout, and I don't remember whether it was the... I, I, I felt like it was the autos. Maybe it was the banks. I don't remember which. doesn't matter, but... Barack Obama had a big meeting at the White House with the CEOs who were taking government stimulus money to keep their banks afloat. They had this um, model where they were going to keep infusing cash into their systems to keep them afloat. And in exchange, the banks and the car companies were going to let Obama insert his people on their board to run and oversee things. That's where we got Focahontas. She rose to prominence during that era, if you remember. She was the ombudsman for all of the federal dollars that were being injected into our system, overseen by Obama. And he put all these people on boards at the car companies. And after a while, after these banks and car companies started to stabilize, they went to Obama and they said, hey, um, thanks a lot, but we, we've got it. We think we're good now. We don't want any more of your money. So if we could end this, that'd be great. And Obama was quoted to have said in Politico, I'll never forget this quote as long as I live. It says everything you need to know about Barack Obama. He said, no, you'll, you'll keep taking the money. He said, gentlemen, it is me that stands between you and the pitchforks. Direct quote in Politico. Check it out. It's me that stands in between you and the pitchforks, meaning the general public. Meaning I have the power to turn the entire country the populace, against you. If you don't continue to do what I want and continue to take the money that I'm handing you, the government money, and that I can continue to insert my controls over you. Ford did not take any of that money, incidentally, back then. 
Um, but Obama loved that control. That was that. That was the, our first real prominent dose of fascism in the modern era under Barack Obama. This public-private partnership, and they've been after the auto industry ever since to control it, reimagine it, destroy it, make cars so expensive you and I can't afford it. The cars that they're making now are plug-in cars. We don't have an in infrastructure to support plug-in cars that you and I can't afford to buy. They're ending the use of fossil fuels. They're forcing car, car companies to manufacture plug-in cars. And if they don't, if they continue to make fossil fuel power cars, gas-powered cars, uh, they will fine car sellers. If you walk onto a lot and you want to buy a gas-powered car, these car companies will be fined for every one they sell. So the government is squeezing the auto industry. They are beating them into submission. Just like I believe ultimately they'll beat the airline industry into submission. These people want very few options, and the options that do exist they want total government control of. The private sector auto industry and I would say the airline industry are probably the two greatest enemies of the wacko eco-green movement. And it also represents, by the way, your freedom and mine. You understand that? Planes and cars are your freedom and mine. Freedom to move, freedom to travel, freedom to assemble. They hate those things the most. They really do. So uh, pay close attention to the fact that these people are out agitating very aggressively. Obama doesn't say much these days. He's busy working behind the scenes. But when he speaks, it's interesting what he speaks about. And this particular thing he's interested in talking about. You'll also note that the uh, brain-dead, mustachioed uh, lurch from Pennsylvania uh, who wears hoodies because he can't put on pants, uh, you'll notice that he doesn't say much because he can't speak. He, he has no command of the English language since his stroke. So when he speaks, it's pretty rare, just like Obama. But note what they're going forward and being public and making a big deal about. The auto industry not being fair. I'm not really sure that Fetterman is the best spokesperson here, but it's noteworthy that he felt he had to address this yesterday on behalf of the UAW. Listen. My message to the, the, CEOs, the CEOs is, you know, at $74 million, you know, collectively earning that, you know, how many yachts can they need, you know, you know to, to, yacht, to water... Uh, ski behind it you know i mean it's just crazy you know i don't his message to the ceos is uh it's 74 million you know collectively earning that you know how many yachts can you need you know to to yacht to water uh ski behind it you know i mean what do you say yesterday in response to marjorie taylor green's criticism over the dress code well, you know, her platform, you know, really, she runs on more and more dingling, you know, picks, you know, on uh, in the the, me the meetings uh, over in, in the Congress. So, I, again, uh, I, I'm not really sure why she cares how I dress, uh, but, you know, she really takes it a different way. Right. Kevin McCarthy, I don't think we talked about this yesterday much, usually because it, it, I don't care much what Kevin McCarthy has to say, but uh, Kevin McCarthy has apparently come out and endorsed Donald Trump, or at least said that he believes at this point Donald Trump will be the nominee. I don't know if you want to call it endorsed, but he's basically said, I don't, I don't think you can beat him. He'll probably be the nominee. Naturally, somebody this high profile the Speaker of the House saying something like that is of concern to somebody like DeSantis, who addressed. Do we didn't we have McCarthy actually? I thought I saw that I had this quote from McCarthy on this issue yesterday or Monday, perhaps on uh, the audio sheet. I thought we had that. Am I misremembering that? No big deal if we don't. Doesn't matter. DeSantis responded to McCarthy, saying that Trump was probably going to be the Republican nominee yesterday. You heard the speaker's comments. Hey, Would morning. you like to respond? You're not on the same level as Trump. Respond to that, please. 
Well, sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, I ran 16 points better than Trump in Florida. I won the greatest victory that's ever been won by a Republican in the history of governor's races. We were supposed to have a red wave in 2022. That, that crashed and burned around the country. Florida, we did. We delivered them four additional Republican congressmen that was instrumental in getting them the bare majority that they have. And I'd also say, uh, you know, since Kevin's been uh, in Congress, they've added trillions and trillions of dollars to the debt, even when we had unified Republican government. Uh, since I've been governor of Florida, we've actually paid down almost 25 percent of our total state debt. We've won budget surpluses every year, and we have the top rated economy in the entire United States. And so we've shown the ability uh, to win big politically and also to deliver on our promises. And that's, I think, what Republican voters want. We always hear the, the rhetoric and then the results usually don't follow. With me, everything I promised I do, I've delivered. You know, it's interesting. Um, DeSantis's line of attack on Trump specifically when people say Trump doesn't look defeatable is that Trump, it, it seems to be the suggestion that Trump is who, and, and there are a lot of people that believe this, and I'm not trying to talk you out of it if you do. Did Trump lose 2022? For Republicans. Now remember the House won by a whisker, a little whisker. And do you remember who's got control of the House? Do you know, we have control of the House, the Republicans do. Kevin McCarthy does. Do you know why? That narrow majority control? Do you remember? So when DeSantis says, or anyone says, Trump cost us the midterms in 2022, do you remember who gave the Republicans the scant majority that they have? Out of curiosity, there's an answer. There were unexpected wins where for Republicans? Uh, oh, I mean, California and New York. That's exactly right. So um, is that Trump's fault that Republicans were shellacked from sea to shining sea? Is that a Trump thing? I, I, I mean, I, you, maybe you think it is. And if you do, I'm not trying to talk you out of it. I just, I think it's interesting. Do you think that the Republican electorate, particularly those who support Trump now, can be convinced that it was Trump's doing that. Now, I know in places like Pennsylvania specifically, um, the very high profile Dr. Oz race got a lot of attention and Oz was Trump's pick. Now, mind you, Oz didn't lose nearly as badly as Mastriano. Trump kind of limped in late and sort of endorsed Mastriano. But I, I, I think Mastriano and Oz, I think a Senate race and a gubernatorial race were apples and oranges in my opinion, but that's uh, neither here nor there. Do you think that 2022 was a shellacking because of Trump? Or do you think 2022 was a shellacking because of January 6th fodder? Uh, or that Trump is to blame for that fodder? Maybe you do. What about uh, the issue of, well, Roe versus Wade wasn't it? When was, now I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember my timeline. Roe versus Wade wasn't overturned pre-2022, was it? Uh, yes. It was. Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah. Was it that? Of course it was that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you see it any other way. They have an abort. I mean, Republicans have this abortion issue. I, I said to a friend of mine yesterday, we pro-life people, we Republicans, we're like the dog that caught the, the wheel on the car. We got it. 50 years of, you know, the March for Life, and we got it. We got so used to silently gathering on the mall in Washington, D.C. every year that we didn't know what we'd do if we actually accomplished it. And then we accomplished it and went, oh, crap. Now what? And now you'll hear a lot of them shout, well, we need a federal ban, which is politically ignorant. We've gone through that. <laughs> um, so state by state, you've started to see people passing heartbeat bills, if not outright bans on abortion. And... Now people want to lay that at Trump's feet. Well, along comes Trump, who says, I think we can negotiate a deal here. And you got a lot of pro-lifers that are now trying to suggest that Trump is uh, a squish and not to be trusted, and he shouldn't be the nominee because of it. it. It's a pretty interesting set of circumstances if you actually walk it out historically. So Trump, Trump and his pro-life stand, Trump and his pro-life judges... Trump getting Roe versus Wade overturned and returned to the states was accomplished. Republicans got their asses handed to them afterward. 
and now everybody wants to shout, you can't trust Trump, and it's also Trump's fault. Is everything Trump's fault? Everything? All of it. All the time. Trump did too much. Trump didn't do enough. Like, it can't be both things. I mean, let's be clear. The Democrat base is now motivated almost singularly by the issue of abortion. Trump delivered on abortion in a way no president ever has since you've been alive. You hear me? Trump delivered on abortion in no way any president ever has since you've been alive. And what did we get in response for that? A motivated Democrat base who punished all of us for it and will continue to. Now comes Trump trying to take a second bite at the apple or third bite, I guess, if you will. And he says, I, I think I got a way to play this. And the pro-lifers say, no, ah, he's a traitor. You can't trust him. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so, it, it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, Trump's done more for pro, and, and Trump, as I said this week, Trump is not a naturally pro-life guy. It's not where he lives. He doesn't care about the issue. As, uh, who was it? Hayward said it. It's a transaction. Trump's a transactional guy. You help me, I'll help you. You help me win, I'll give you your judges. He did. Deal. And by the way, I think he'd do it again. Trump's a transactional guy. He was before, he still is now. You can't trust him. I, I think you can trust him if, if you help him. If you help him get to where he wants to go, he'll deliver what you deal, what, what the handshake was. But like... You know, for DeSantis to say that 2022 was a failing of Donald Trump, I don't, I don't think strategically that makes any sense. Ron DeSantis is going to have to deal with abortion just the same if he's successful. And, and I would argue that Ron DeSantis is going to carry with him the ooga booga social issues uh, ghost that not even Donald Trump carries with him. Donald Trump may have January 6th and impeachment and that sort of thing, but as, I've, as I, I think everybody understands... They're suggesting Ron DeSantis is a Klansman who hates gays and trans people. So I, 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 this idea that Trump, Trump cost us the election. Well, I'll, I'll tell you who will cost us even more aggressively, in my view, if you want to know the truth be told. And I mean it. I'd vote for him in a heartbeat, and I'd be enthusiastic if he's our nominee. But you're kidding yourself if you think Ron DeSantis isn't going to animate the left. You're kidding yourself. The Chris DeGall Show Podcast.